Am I speaking really fast? Because I'm buzzing. I'm, I'm, I'm literally buzzing. That's, that's what happens. I'm trying to be more restrained for Daniel's sake. <sighs> There's that possibility. I put a note to myself here. Um, if I'm buzzing, that means I'll probably speak faster than usual. If you're watching on YouTube, feel free to put it at 0.75 speed <laughs> so you can slow this thing down. We'll see. We are starting a new series today. It's different from our previous series for reasons that will be obvious shortly, but I would like to pray, and then we will get into our message for today. Let's pray. I'm going to kneel. Father in heaven, Lord, I just want to thank you, Lord, for this privilege, for this blessing to open your word once again. Lord, my prayer remains the same, that you hide the messenger behind the message and behind the cross of Calvary, that any and all glory goes back to you and to you alone. Lord, open not just our minds, but our hearts as well as we open your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We all have our, I guess, you know, habits and things like that. And kneeling in prayers is one way. But our series today is going to be a little bit different. The title, as you can see, is In Defense of Faith and God. It's part of a new series, part one of a new series that we call In Defense of. So this series is what we call an apologetics series. And I'll explain what that is in a moment. But I want to give you a brief overview of what the next couple of months actually will look like. So today... In defense of faith and God. Next week, in defense of the Bible. So these first two is basically one presentation, kind of split into two. So there's so much to say that I kind of had to split into two. But I won't necessarily leave you hanging per se. But I kind of did write this week and next week's presentation together. July 17th, Dan will take us through in defense of the church, why we need the church. Um, and then on July 24th, we have one of our own, Jamie, who is a vet. So he's going to approach creation from a scientific perspective. And he works a lot with animals. You've heard his children's story if you've been attending for a little while. We're going to talk about in defense of the Sabbath, why we as Seventh-day Adventists celebrate something called the Sabbath. In defense of evil in this world, August 7th, we have a break on August 14th. Pastor Wayne Bone from Hope Channel will take us through um, a sermon that he has planned. And then we're going to finish our series with a bright, cheerful topic of hell and everlasting punishment on August 21st. What a way to end, right? Um, so that's our series, I guess. In a nutshell, I mentioned that I'm going to take an apologetics approach to this series. How many of you have heard that term before? Yeah? Okay. Some of you have. Some of you are like, oh, what's that? And it's like, why are you, Daniel's just got baptized. Why are you taking such, such a weird sort of approach to a sermon series? Now, at a glance, you look at the word apologetics, at worst, it suggests that you must apologize for something, right? And at best, apologetics is kind of like you have to defend a doubtful or a compromised position. But let me just set the stage a little bit, okay? The origin of the word apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, which simply means a verbal defense. So in other words, you are just making a defense for what you believe in. Hence the sermon series title, In Defense Of. The word apologia is used eight times in the New Testament, and this is the last time it's used uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. So the word apologia is that to give an answer, to give a defense, but do this, note how Peter finishes with, do this with gentleness and respect. Anyone here got into an internet argument before with anyone? I'm looking at more on this side of the room. Yes, you have, Christopher. Of course you have. 
Have you ever felt like you want to stab yourself in the eye with a keyboard because you can't stab the other person? And you come to the point where you're like, why doesn't this person get it? But Peter says, if you're going to defend your faith, do it with gentleness and respect. Now, someone once said this to me, someone very wise, I would give credit if I could remember who it was, but I couldn't. But I think the person said it to me to tell me, and I've taken it on board ever since. And the person said this, don't set out to win the argument, set out to win the person. Don't set out to win the argument, set out to win the person. And I'm thinking about that, I'm like, no, you're wrong. (laughs) That's probably why I can't remember who said it to me. Christian apologetics isn't about setting out to prove someone wrong. Our purpose as we go through this series is twofold. Um, As a Christian, we hope that we can give you some coherent ideas and thoughts to, I guess, solidify your own faith journey, number one. And number two, allow you to have the tools to stand up to any scrutiny. I'll talk about that in just a moment. But wherever you are in your faith journey, or maybe you're just tuning in and you have no idea what this is all about, you don't share the faith, But I pray that you get an idea of why we believe what we believe. So, I talk about scrutiny. I believe that there are some of us, even here right now, who basically have said to me, no, 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 we shouldn't open ourselves to study and read and all that stuff, because then our faith will be tested. Now, there is some truth in that, because it will be impractical. I mean, given our finite time, you don't want to explore every single avenue and thing under the sun, of course, right? It will be impossible and impractical. However, I do believe that our faith, if you want to call it that, a belief, should be able to stand up to scrutiny. That we shouldn't be afraid to ask the why questions. Parents, if you are not ready to entertain the hard questions from your kids, they're not going to stop asking it. They're going to ask their friends, they're going to ask their teachers, and they're going to ask the internet. So that's why we're doing this series. I strongly believe that my faith can stand up to scrutiny and we'll journey through some of these theological thoughts together. All right, so here's how we're going to do the rest of our message today in two parts. Oh, I must apologize to the young adults who came on Wednesday night. I said I was only going to use one Bible verse. I lied because I already used one. (laughs) I'm actually going to use three Bible verses. That's it. I have my laptop. I don't even have my Bible up the front with me. Um, You know, the topic is in defense of faith and God. I feel like to start, it will be almost disingenuous to use the Bible to defend faith and God. That's next week. That's why I said I wrote the two sermons kind of back to back. I'll explain more of that in a moment. But we're going to do the rest of the sermon in two parts. In the first half, first part rather... We're going to talk about the importance of consistency, okay? Consistency, that's the first part. And in the second part, we're going to talk about assumptions and experience. So part one, consistency. Second part, assumptions and experience. And all this, of course, is in the context of defending faith and God. All right, let's start with consistency. I'm going to show you three statements. Just three statements off the bat. And... I'm going, to throw you, I'm going to show them to you back to back to back, and I want you to read them um, and tell me if you think there is a problem with them or you think they are perfectly logical and valid statements, okay? This is where I know we have to wear masks in church, but I want to see the expression. I have just, I just have to read your eyes. Okay, here's the first one. Here's the first one. America is the best place to live because it's better than any other country. Okay, I know, I, I know how you feel about that already. The news is fake because so much of the news is fake. This is an actual quote from a world leader. No point in guessing who. Everyone loves Joe because Joe is so popular. Okay. Have you heard these statements set in whatever context before? Well, what's the problem with these statements? It's what is called circular reasoning, right? It's like, why is America the best place to live? Oh, because it's better than any other country in the world. 
Why is the news fake? Because, well, so much of it is fake, then when you hear it, of course it's, it's fake. Why does everyone love Joe? Because he's so popular. These circular reasoning, they give absolutely nothing. They don't give a logical evidence or progression that allows a neutral person to go, hmm, yeah, I can see why you said that. But as Christians, we are guilty of the exact same thing. For example, God exists because the Bible says so. The Bible is inspired. Therefore, we know that God exists. How many of you believe that statement to be true? Oh, see, now, see, see, now you're like, that statement is true, but I don't know how that sounds to somebody who doesn't believe that statement. From an apologetics perspective, when you're giving a verbal defense, we need to kind of take a step back before we get to the truth of that statement. We must be consistent in how we look at our faith if we want to properly defend it. The Christians Apologetics and Research Ministry, CARM.org, I mean, that's lots of stuff to read there, right? Uh, the website lists 20 fallacies or logical fallacies. In other words, 20 different kinds of inconsistencies that can occur when people present their viewpoints. And some of these, as soon as I said, you will recognize it almost immediately because not only have you seen them, I guarantee you've probably used them yourself. Now, I'm not going to do all 20. I've just picked 12 at random, but you should be able to see the pattern pretty quickly. So this is no particular order, um, but the first one is what is called ad hominem, which is literally to the person. Ad hominem is attacking the individual instead of the argument. For example, you are so stupid, your argument possibly couldn't be true. Who uses that a lot? Just say, I know who you want to say, but just politicians, right? We, we, the politicians label a person a certain name, and therefore what she said, what he said definitely can't be true because she's crooked, he's this, he's that, he's all of that stuff. Ad hominem. Here's another logical fallacy. Appeal to force. Telling the hearer that something bad will happen to them if they do not accept the argument. So CARM, C-A-R-M, Christian's Apologetics Research Ministry, literally uses this example. Convert or die. And that's one of the things we'll talk about, hell and everlasting punishment. Imagine if someone said to you, you need to accept the love of Jesus, or if you don't, you're going to burn in hell forever. Attacking or appealing to force. Appeal to pity. Urging the hearer to accept the argument based upon an appeal to emotions, sympathy, etc. You owe me big time because I really stuck my neck out for you. Some preachers use that. Just, just sow a little seed, you know, you will f it's the right thing to do. Now, now, you know me, I've appealed to emotions before, but that is not the only thing that you need to appeal to. Let's keep going. Appeal to tradition, to accept something because it has been done or believed for a long time. We have always done it this way. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is not guilty of that at all. Begging the question, we already talked about this, assuming the thing to be true, but you are tr that you're trying to prove God exists because the Bible says so, the Bible's inspired, therefore we know that God exists. Cause and effect, assuming that the effect is related to a cause because the events occur together. When the rooster crows, the sun rises, therefore the rooster causes the sun to rise. <laughs> now we know that to not be true, but you'll be surprised. I mean... Dan Andrews came back to work and Australia's in lockdown. Coincidence? There's a difference between causation, correlation, and coincidence, but you'll be surprised how often people use that argument. Fallacy of composition, assuming that what is true of the part is true for the whole. You are weird, that means your family is weird too. Well, that's probably true for some of you, but that's okay. Fallacy of equivocation, using the same term in an argument in different places, but the word has different meanings. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, therefore a bird is worth more than George Bush. <laughs> Probably also true. Anyway, let's move on. False dilemma, false dichotomy, giving two choices when in actuality there could be more. Do you still beat your wife? 
Now, that's asking literally the wrong question. And that's actually something that we will address a little bit when we look at some of these theological aspects, these theological discussions, right? Asking the right question. Just three more, guilty by association. Rejecting an argument or claim because the person proposing it likes someone who is disliked by another. He the liked dogs, therefore dogs are bad. <laughs> Poisoning the well. Presenting negative information about a person before he or she speaks so as to discredit the person's argument. Frank is pompous, arrogant, and thinks he knows everything. So, let's hear what Frank has to say about the subject. <laughs> and finally, there are 20, but I'm just picking 12. Um, double standard. Applying a standard to another that is different from what is applied to you. Those rules don't apply to me since I am older than you. You know how? Kids, right? How come daddy can do that? How come mommy, I can't do that? And, and mommy, what does mommy say? Because I told you so. Now, moms, you have a reason to say that. And it's okay. Because sometimes kids, when your mom says that, most of the time, you, because, just, just do it. Just, just do it, okay? <laughs> The thing is, if you want to pre 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 uh, present a defense for your faith, um, you need to be consistent. And if someone is challenging your faith, there really is no point if the person refuses to have any level of consistency. Before you even get to the heartfelt, you know, the, which is the part two that I'm going to talk about, um, there is kind of no point. And I felt like if we're going to do an apologetics series, a defense series, we had to start with this idea of inconsistencies because it's so prevalent in society these days. Everyone thinks they know better than anyone else. So here's what happens. An inconsistent approach leads to the wrong kind of assumptions, which then creates an incorrect conclusion. Okay, let me say that again. An inconsistent approach leads to the wrong kind of assumptions, which then creates an incorrect conclusion. And now we come to the second part of our presentation today, when I talk about assumptions and experiences. You know, the title is In Defense of Faith and God, and there are so many ways I could have approached this. I literally had about eight or nine options, and I bounced a couple of ideas with... Um, uh, Dan, you know, should we approach it this way? We talked about science, and we will a little bit next week, and that will kind of carry out throughout our series. But I have decided to look at faith and God from the perspective of assumptions and experiences. Now, what do I mean? Well, very simply, assumptions drive experience. Let, let, me, let me say it again. Assumptions drive experience, right? Have you ever been to a restaurant recommended by someone, and they say to you, this is the best pasta you will ever, ever taste. And then what happens when you get there? It's never as good as what is advertised, isn't it? Once you get there, you're like, it's, it's nice, but it's certainly not the best pasta I've ever tasted. But if you went to that restaurant and nobody had given you anything, you haven't read up any reviews, and the pasta comes out and it's good, you're like, wow, this is, this is actually good. Because your assumptions have driven your experience. You see, faith and God isn't actually that different. Now, before you go, did Yoshi just compare God to pasta? <laughs> of course not. My point is simply this. Whether you are a Christian or not, whether, wherever you are in your faith journey, you have made some assumptions about faith and God already. And without realizing, we really make assumptions all the time. I'm going to tell you a funny story. I think it's funny. Some of you will think it's tragic. Brace yourself. It's about me, so it's all right. My first um, 2011 time preaching as a youth pastor, and I'll tell you which church it is, Kingscliff Church. Kingscliff Church is by the coast. I'm a youth pastor. I get up. I preach. I did what I thought was a pretty decent sermon. And this guy comes running to me after church. 
And this is literally what he says. I'll never forget it. He says, I'm so glad you speak English. I felt like going, oh, yeah, fair thank you, mate. <laughs> now, I, have, I had a choice right there and right then to make. I can go the not-so-polite route, or I can choose to change my assumptions. That he probably saw Yong Shin Chi, which is my Chinese name, okay? And I probably speak like this the whole time. And it, he would have been correct. But then when I got up there, G'day, church, how's it going? <laughs> he had that, it was that disconnect. So I simply chose to look back at my assumptions and think, hmm, this person just hadn't been exposed. He's lived in the Central Coast, probably haven't, I don't, I don't know what it was. His experience, now, the best part, I don't know to be, I, I thought it was funny, I don't know to be, I guess, I was flattered because he literally went around saying, you need to listen to this guy. He is really, really good. He goes, can I have 20 copies of that sermon because I need to spread. And he's like, my, I was like, thanks. We make assumptions. Um, as, as we go through the series together, I want you to, as we come to the second part of the sermon, I want you to challenge your assumptions and perhaps consider how that has impacted your experience with God. Consider this verse in John chapter 10 and verse 10. I said we we're going to do three Bible verses today. This is the second of our three Bible verses. John chapter 10 and verse 10, the Bible says this. The thief does not come to steal, uh, except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So Jesus is speaking. He's saying Christianity, it's about a life more abundant. Another version says half life to the full. What, what does that mean? I, I want to ask those who you would consider yourself a Christian, a dedicated Christian. How many of you believe that? Don't put your hand up. Because you're like, I want to believe that. That is the right thing to say. Well, I want to challenge your assumption. I want to tell you about a guy by the name of Blaise Pascal. In fact, I think I have used this illustration about five years ago. Let me just read Blaise Pascal. He lived from 19th June 1623 to 19th August 1662, born in June, so obviously quite very smart. He was a child prodigy who was educated by his father, a tax collector in ruin. Pascal's earliest work was in the natural and applied sciences, where he made important contributions to the study of fluids and clarified the concepts of pressure and vacuum by generalizing the work of Evangelista Torricelli. Pascal also wrote in defense of the scientific method. In 1642, while still a teenager, he started some pioneering work on calculating machines. After three, efforts, three years of effort and 50 prototypes, he built 20 finished machines called Pascal's calculators and later Pascalines over the following 10 years, establishing him as one of the first two inventors of the mechanical calculator. So Blaise Pascal, smart person, for all intents and purposes, an intelligent man, but he was also a Christian. So he found this correlation between science and faith, the scientific method, right? He took what many today would consider an apologetics approach. Commenting on Christianity, this is what he says. Since the existence of God cannot be proved or disproved through reason, and there is much to be gained from wagering that God exists, and little to be gained from wagering that God doesn't exist, a rational person should simply wager that God exists and live accordingly. Now, this has been dubbed Pascal's wager, Pascal's bet, and let me break this down a little bit more. So let's take that first part of the statement. Since the existence of God cannot be proved or disproved through reason. So what he's saying is that you cannot scientifically prove or disprove God, not in the way you can prove 1 plus 1 equals 2, or 1 plus 1 does not equal 3, okay? So you, you can't do that. And there are many things in, in the world, in sciences, that you can't just, you just, you can't disprove, you can't prove, you just simply don't understand. For example, women. Okay, fine. 
men as well. There you go. Happy? You just go, we're just going to accept it. Amen. And we get along just fine. But you know what Pascal is saying, right? He's saying, he's saying um, we cannot definitively say God exists or doesn't exist the way we can say one plus one equals two. So on that assumption, Pascal says this, and there is much to be gained from wagering that God exists and little to be gained from wagering that God doesn't exist. A rational person should simply wager that God exists and live accordingly. In other words, let me break it down. This is Pascal's wager. He's saying, live as a Christian, because if you are correct that God does exist, you lose nothing and gain everything. But if you are wrong, well, you lose nothing and you gain nothing. Okay? Let me explain further. Let me explain further. Let me break it down for you a little bit further. In a wager, in a bet, and by the way, I'm in no way condoning gambling or betting. The only wager I condone is Pascal's wager, okay? There are three components to a bet, three components to a wager. Here are the three components. The size of the prize, the chances of winning that prize, and the risk involved. You with me? Size of the prize, the chances of winning that prize, and the risk involved. Let me give you an example. Tats Lotto. Here are the three components. The size of the prize is millions of dollars. Looking good? Yes? The chances of winning that prize is one in 45 million, depending on which draw you go into. So in other words, every single man, woman, child in Australia can buy two tickets and there will still be no winners. Well, thereabouts. So think about that. The chances of winning is infinitely small, and the risk involved is the price of a ticket. So if you participate in this bet, and it is gambling, this is what you stand to lose. You stand to lose the price of a ticket, which is, I don't know. Give it to me. Put it in the offering bag. Buy me a drink or something. Now, let me present to you another wager. Um, let's, let's, let's change this around a little bit. Let's call this the coin flip wager, the coin flip bet. I'm going to toss a coin, and if you guess it correctly, you will get $5 million. Cool? What are the chances of winning? It's not a trick question. Well, one in two, 50-50. Your chances of winning is 50-50. Looking good so far? So the only thing that would stop you is the risk involved. Now, what if I told you that the risk is, if you get it wrong, you go to jail for 30 years? How many of you would take that bet? Oh, not a single one. There's, there usually always is one, and it's usually like a, yes, Emma, you would. <laughs> what jail are you talking about? <laughs> Because you're looking at this, yes, the chances, the odds are good. I mean, the, the price is good, the odds are good. But the risk, if we invest in this, we're going to lose out. Now, um, it's not worth it. So Pascal, based on these theorems, says that we should bet on God. Because essentially, and this is our third and final verse for today, Christianity is based around this verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's a verse that is familiar to a lot of us here, if not most of us here in one way, shape, or form. So again, let's break it down. There are three components. The size of the prize is eternal life. Good prize? Yep. Okay. Live forever, right? Fantastic. Now, the chances of winning that prize. So the prize is worth it. So what should stop us? Either the chances of winning or the risk. Uh, here's the question. What are the chances of winning that prize? Okay, how many of you say 50-50? How many of you say 100%? Okay, how many of you are not sure, thinking it's a trick question, because Yoshi likes to ask those? <laughs> now think about this. Your immediate reaction is 
50-50, because what if we're wrong? I'll come back to that, right? But listen to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, who is able to should not perish but have everlasting life. So the price is eternal life. That was, a, that, was, that was quite exciting. It's my favorite verse. You can understand, right? So all you need to do is believe, and that's it. If I were to say to I don't have my phone with me. If I were to say to you, I'll just use your phone, babe. If I were to say to you, there is a f- giveaway of a mobile phone. And all you need to do is just take it. Nice try, Tim. As soon as you accept to be a part of this bet, this wager, you've automatically received. So I don't know who said 100%, and a number of you have, but literally, according to that verse, the chances of winning is literally 100%. That's that's, That's what the whole concept of belief is, right? The chance of winning that prize, the need to believe, is 100%. Because you believe it, you've got it. It's not believe, follow God, and then there's a one in three chance of getting eternal life. No, you believe, follow God, and that's it. So the only thing that should be stopping you, according to Pascal, is the risk involved. Now, what is the risk involved? How many of you say 50-50? Because you could be wrong. Anybody want (laughs) to? Nobody wants to put their hand up anymore. Your immediate response, in fact, when I I think when I did this previously, so some of you may did this, and I've done this in in another church, and literally everyone, half the church put their hand up, yep, yep, it's 50 50, because that's a risk, because you might be wrong. But listen to what Pascal is saying. He's saying, even if you are wrong, you lose nothing. And here's why he says that. Because if you are wrong, the Bible still promises abundant life. It's a life, if lived according to Christ's principles, is better in every single way. Or at least it should be. And the reason a lot of us don't see that is because we apply not just an inconsistent approach based on incorrect assumptions that give us an incomplete experience of faith in God, but we have been hurt, jaded, broken by our experiences, by people. But Pascal had it figured out. He says, you lose nothing, so essentially there is no risk. Somehow, the Christian life is seen as, by people, as inferior and a waste. And so we only have eternal life to look forward to. And if we took that away, if we took away this concept of being able to live forever, sitting on clouds and playing harps, supposedly, then there's no need to be a Christian. Without recognizing and realizing that Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, that they may have it more abundantly. You know, wherever we are in our journey, we've made certain assumptions that have shaped our experiences about faith and God. And oftentimes, I've realized that the inconsistencies of the church, of leaders, of pastors have contributed to shaping these assumptions. And for that, I am sorry. But your walk with God is literally just that. When we come to think of faith of God in perhaps less desirable terms, why should I believe in so-and-so if so-and-so behaves this way or acts this way or says this, that, or the other? My challenge to you, and you're probably right, but my challenge to you is simply this. To look past some of these assumptions, faith and God has so much to offer even right now. If we look at it right, my prayer 
is that even as Dan and I attempt to, I guess, appeal to the more intellectual component of your faith, because that is the apologetics side of things, that you would re-examine where you stand, whether you are a believer or not. Perhaps there's so much more to faith and God that you might have misunderstood or not completely been open to before. I want to close. I'm going to invite the musicians to come up. I want to sing a song that's one of my favorites. It's called Ancient Words. We'll look at the Bible next week, going back to the basics of why we can believe in the Bible. But let me highlight the second verse, which says this. Words of life, words of hope. Give us strength, help us cope. In this world, wherever we roam, ancient words will guide us home. My prayer and I'm going to finish in a way that you would have never expected. My prayer, as we close, as you take this away, this, what I've said is this. Do you remember one word? Mangoes. What did Yoshi preach about? You can say consistencies, assumptions, and experience. Remember this. Mangoes. Mangoes are one of the sweetest fruits in the world. If I had a mango with me, I'd tell you how sweet and juicy it is. But you won't know until you taste it for yourself.